came off of some of you just came off of an amazing periscope uh, by my spiritual father I want to apologize because I am not a person that delays the time um, if I've set a time to you I really want to commit to that so I apologize ahead of time but I honor my leadership so I honor my father and so uh, he was doing a periscope on the father's heart and clearly I wanted to hear that because you know I'm the pastor I'm all about the father's heart and so there's no way that I was going to cut in on him sharing what he shared but I knew that I needed to come and uh, share this word that I promised to share with you last night and also um, I also needed to touch base with those people who are not friends who are not connected with my apostles so since, since you might not be connected with him you know I didn't want to leave you hanging so for those of you who are not connected and don't know why you didn't see me at 10 30 or 10 45 I apologize ahead of time and so I'm not going to believe the time I'm going to jump in we've got a prophet JD coming up around 12 30 maybe 12 45 we'll see when he comes in um, but I want to get this to you so as I said before I'm really excited about this word that I want to share with you today we're going to be talking about advancing the kingdom of God. We're really going to be discussing again. Bless you. Hi, Deborah. Um, we're going to be discussing the fact that Jesus is the master builder. And if you know anything about Jesus, what he, was he mostly concerned with in building? It was building us. And I'm also sorry that I've got this light shirt on. So it's really okay. That's a little bit better. Hey, hey, how are you? Um, lady, I get to see you. Bless you, Kendra. Good to see you, too. Bless you all. Uh, welcome. Uh, let everyone know who you are. Tell us who you are so that people know y'all can connect. I love to have family. For me, it is about Kononia. Kononia is true fellowship true Christian fellowship and when we think about true fellowship what we're thinking of is communion when we think of communion as this simple thing where we eat bread and we uh, drink the wine and re really represents the body of Christ what it is is really us coming together in unity hey it's the bestie that's my best friend Erica bless you she lives in Ohio Wanda from Georgia bless you um, and so what we find in this what we're gonna be talking about is advancing the kingdom what does the kingdom look like Christy from Amarillo bless you what does the kingdom look like in the first place? If we're, it, uh, yes, Baton Rouge, bless you, Louisiana. Um, if we're advancing the kingdom, what does the kingdom look like? The kingdom has order. We already talked about that. It, it's an institution. It has structure, right? There are ways that things function, ways that things don't. Let's understand it. But this message really has a lot to do with those who don't know their calling. There are many of you who don't really know what God has called you to do, and there are some who feel like you're between one thing and the next. And I'm telling you, God will shift you. You will start at one place, and God will grow you up as he fills you up, and he'll take you to a new level. So, understand that. So, we're talking about shifting in identity. So, identity, unity, advancing the kingdom, Jesus the master builder. And his greatest masterpiece is you. And that's what he's mostly concerned about building up. So he would not have you ignorant not only of Satan's devices, but he would not have you ignorant about the gift that he placed on the inside of you. The gift that many of you have yet to open. So if we think about Christmas, there are gifts underneath that tree. And many of us um, cannot even sleep the night before Christmas because we want to open those gifts. We're imagining those gifts. Um, if you're like me, you snuck downstairs to see the gifts. And I remember the year my mom used the cheapest paper that ever existed where we could actually look and see what our gifts were because the paper was so thin she 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 swear next time that she was gonna wrap them twice if she used that cheap paper again but I say that to say there God has placed a gift on the inside of you but many of you have yet to open the gift not simply his salvation but it says after we get salvation what's the next thing let's let's move on to know him more know him more to the greater right let's move beyond just knowing we are saved God wants so much more out of you he's placed so much in you you are his greatest investment and his greatest masterpiece amen Amen. So um, I'm just going to do a real quick prayer. Um, I, I've been praying and I've been listening to um, my father and the ministry this morning talk about the father's heart. And so I believe that the Lord's spirit is with us right now. And those of you who've, who've left that uh, periscope and come to this one, bless you. Thank you. And so uh, we're going to talk about advancing the kingdom. We're going to talk about unity and identity and knowing what God has called you to do. So I pray right now, oh God, on this periscope that you would touch your people, that you would give them ears to hear. Oh, Father God, that you'd move me out of the way. Allow your Holy Spirit to speak, that you would walk well, that you would fill us, Lord, with fresh oil, that you would allow fresh wind to blow upon our land, oh God, that you would even heal the dark and broken places within us, God, even the dry land where we have, oh God, we ask for fresh rain to come now, oh God, Lord, we stand, Lord, we surrender to you, to your will and your way, oh God, we surrender our dreams, our desires, all that is within us, God, that it might be used for your lifting up of your kingdom, we pray right now that we would be a help to somebody else, that we would not be a hindrance 
deliverance. We pray right now that we are those that have clean hands and a pure heart, Lord, who can ascend your mountain, oh God, that we are, we are the children of Jacob. We are the generation that will seek your face and not just your hand. So we give you praise. We give you glory and we thank you for your word, which gives us life. We bless you in Jesus name. All right. So when we think about the kingdom of God, what we find is in order for us to translate ourselves from a knowledge of salvation to a place of being used by God, a sharpened tool in his hand, sharpened tool in the master's hand. The way that we get there starts with agreement and alignment. Agreement and alignment. And what does this mean? We know Amos says that how can two walk together lest they be agreed? So how can you say you're connected to the master when you don't agree with his word? How do you say that you agree with the Lord and yet another brother and sister you can't get along with? So God said, come into agreement with me, come into alignment, walk together. And, and this also, this agreement we can find in Job 22, 21 that says, it says, acquaint now thyself with him and be at peace, thereby good shall come unto you. What does acquaint mean? It means to get to know. It means to make yourself um, connected with. It means to have a revelation of a knowledge of an intimacy with, right? And this alignment, when we're thinking about agreement, says that we should press in to know him press in to know God the more press in you find this in Hosea 6 and it says that his coming is as sure as the dawn he's coming as we press in to know him he comes in as the dawn as we know that tomorrow is going to come and the sun is going to rise he shall come in like the dawn and it says not only shall he come in we know he shall come it says but he shall come in like the rain don't you love that he shall come in like the rain, like the fresh rain upon your land. It says the latter rain and the former rain upon your land. That's how he'll come in. When we come into agreement and alignment with him. The next thing is once we come into agreement and alignment with the master, he gives us access. He begins to open doors. He begins to give us open access. And what, what does this access mean? It means doors that are open for you. And in some cases, it means shutting off access to those things that are not profitable for us. Do you hear us? Thank you, Brother JD. Do you hear me? Some things that are unprofitable for you, God would shut those doors. And so sometimes when things are shut down in your life, you need to thank God. You need to not say what happened, but God has is he's derailed that situation situation to bring you on the right path. Are you hearing me? So bless God. So he gives us access and we find that in Revelation 3, which I love when he's talking about the church of Philadelphia. And what did he say? He said, I know your works. I know your works. And God is saying for you, many of you out there who are weary, who are tired, who, who feel restless in your spirit. God said, I know your works. And he says, I have opened a door that no man may shut. And he said, and though you're weary, he said, I know you're tired. I know you feel heavy. He says, but because in the midst of that place, you did not deny my name, I'm going to bless you. He said, I'm opening the door that no man can shut. And so I said, we get agreement and alignment and then access. God begins to open up doors for us. He begins to give us a way in. And once he gives us access, what happens? We get assignments. We begin to hear from the Lord. Once I have access and think of it as I'm coming into his courts, I'm coming into his courts. Now he's opened that door and he's allowed me to come in. And now that I've come in, he says, now I'll give you something to do. Now that you've aligned yourself with me, you've come into agreement with my word. I I've given you access to me. I've opened up doors for you. And now I'll begin to lay on you assignments. I begin to tell you what to do. And what's so important about assignments? Oftentimes people may ask me to come and teach and come and preach. And can you do this for me? And I say, well, let me see. Is this, is this just um, an engagement? And I have to hear from the Lord, not what they say. Is this an engagement, Lord? Or is it an assignment? Meaning, am I sent out to do this work? Are you hearing me? I, I don't want any more engagements. Are you hearing me? Especially even for you singers. I don't want any more engagements. I don't want you to lift me up on no altar. I don't want to be pat on the back. I don't want to just be a part of the crew. I don't want to be the one that's sitting right on this team. I don't want to be sitting on the desk. No, I want to be in an assignment, meaning God sent me. He placed something on the inside of me for these people for this hour. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? You know, and this is what helps those of you who God is beginning to use to be on time. What does that mean? Not timely, but it means about his appointed time. Do you hear me now? Appointed time, my God, in the fullness of time. Do you hear me? Appointed time, fullness of time, right? In his timing. So when I know it's an assignment, I say, oh my God, I'm in God's timing. It's his timing, which means he's going to do the work. 
right? It makes my job easy because it's an assignment, which means he's already set it in order. He's ordained it. He's called it to be. And the work shall go forward, even if I don't see it with my eyes. Are you hearing me? Because there's sometimes you can go in a place and it's really hard and you say, God, I, I don't know that the people receive. But God said it's an assignment. I sent you to do a work. And maybe you were just sent to break up the fallow ground. Maybe the rain is not coming, but I wanted you to break up some hard spaces in there through what you did. Now leave the rest to me. And when we think about uh, uh, calling people to the kingdom, not all of us water and uh, harvest at the same time. We don't sow the seed, water it, and harvest it, correct? Many of us just water. Many of us come and we harvest, right? But all the increase goes to whom? Hallelujah. It goes to Jesus. It goes to God. All the increase goes to him. Even though some water, right? And some, you know, put in the seeds or, you know, till it up. At the end of the day, God brings the increase. So we've got agreement and alignment. We've got access where doors begin to open, where the Lord begins to give us access to new areas where he shuts off um, access to areas that are unprofitable for us. Are you hearing me? Yes. Go ahead. Speak that, Kendra. That's what I'm saying. At the end of the day, God gives the increase. And then we have access and then we get assignments. Once we are set, we begin to get assignments. Once again, not engagements, but we get assignments. Now, after assignments, you're going to love this. When you start taking on assignments of the Lord. Not assignments you want to take. Not things that are going to pay you a lot of money. And I had a conversation with a young lady at, the, at this conference at the end where she was talking about she had been in her ministry. She was having some difficulty. Um, a a well-known prophet came from out of town and invited her to come and to play at his event. Now, mind you, she has Sunday service. Yes, just do your part. And this is exactly what I'm talking about, Denise. She, she um, had committed to her ministry every Saturday, but this this well-known prophet came and asked her. Now, mind you, I don't know that he knew she had a, 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 a regular Sunday responsibility. But he asked her, and hey, anybody can ask you. Anybody can ask you to come and do anything. But it's how you respond. That's the point. And so he asked, and she thought, well, I'm going to go because this is a greater opportunity for me. And my church is not treating me well anyway. And so I said to her, I said, you know, let me say this to you. Whatever you decide to do, and yes, it sounds like a great opportunity, and God can elevate you through this. I said, but God can elevate you also, you know, by doing the right thing. I said, at the end of the day, he honors faithfulness. At the end of the day, God honors our faithfulness. He's expecting at least that much out of you, right? So I said to her, just like God can bless you in doing this, he can bless you the more from being faithful, right? He said obedience is better than sacrifice. So you being obedient to what you've been called to do, swallowing down your pride in the midst of that place where you're at, showing that, you know what, I'm going to still be here. I'm not going to let you push me out of my position. I'm going to stay here and be faithful, though I'm gritting my teeth, though I can't stand it, though I feel the spirit is dead in this place. But God has called me to be here. He's appointed me to be here. He has made this my assignment. Are you hearing me? God has made this my assignment. I'm not going to leave my assignment until it's fulfilled. Do you hear me? God will bless you for being faithful. So we get assignments. Are you hearing me? We get assignments and then through your assignment, wrong spirit. <laughs> Amen. Wrong spirit. Exactly. We get assignments and then what do we get? God grants us authority. Are you hearing me? I love this. Agreement, alignment, access. Then we get assignments. And once we get those assignments, God empowers us, Jesus, to do his work. Truly, the word charisma, understand, it doesn't mean people who have great personalities and you like the way she dressed or the way she talks. Charisma is the activation of the Holy Spirit on the inside to preach God's word, to do his work. Are you hearing me? So charisma comes in, the Holy Spirit, charisma comes in and animates you and gives you authority to do the work of the Lord. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? I'm getting excited, y'all. So we get these assignments, but God doesn't say, I'm giving you this assignment and then I'm going to allow you to be weak and mealy with it. And I'm just going to leave you to do it all on your own and, you know, figure it out however you need to. Go ask your pastor. Go ask your prophet. Go ask your apostle how to do it. I'm going to let you figure it out. No. Holy Spirit comes in and says, because this person has agreement with the Lord, they've aligned themselves with him. They're now in peace. They have access. We begin to open the doors to them. God has granted them this assignment. I have to. Are you hearing me? God said his word shall not return unto him void. So if he's assigned it, then he's ordained it. And it is his responsibility to empower you supernaturally to do it. That's it. That's it. And just say, I believe it. <laughs>
Say I believe it. Say I believe it. Even if I don't feel it, I believe it. If God is giving me an assignment, he is supernaturally empowering me and granting me the authority to bring it to pass. Are you hearing me? Ha! I believe it. Amen. I believe it. And so once we're granted this authority, guess what happens? Advancement comes. Thank you, Wanda. Yes, believe it. Advancement comes. Are you hearing me? So we grant, uh, the, he grants us this authority, and then advancement comes. We begin to break up the fallow ground. Yes, Deborah. We begin to break up the fallow ground. We begin to see our communities shift and change. We begin to see our house shift and change. We begin to see our cities shift and change. We begin to see our state shift and change. Are you hearing me? We begin to see our communities Shift and change. We begin to see our nation shift and change. Advancement comes. But here it's under alignment. There's an order. There's an order. There's an order. So alignment is where it begins. Agreement is where it begins. We get access. We get assignments. We're granted authority. And we advance the kingdom. Lastly, you're going to love this one. The apostolic is established. Ha! Huh? So after we're granted authority, after we begin to advance and God gives us the ability to advance his kingdom, his kingdom, right? The apostolic is established. Hallelujah. The apostolic. Are you hearing me? This is all fivefold gifts together, but the apostolic is life changing. It's reformation. Are you hearing me? Right? It's not that, that small change. It's not the relief. It's the release of God's presence and his spirit, right? It's a lasting change in your circumstance, in your environment, in your situation, in the nation. There is a lasting change. We begin to see that shift. So as we can see, we're not yet aligned. We're still not in agreement. We're still not granted access. We've not understood the difference between assignments and engagements. We've not yet taken the authority that God has granted to us. We've not yet started to advance the kingdom because we're too busy advancing our own agendas. We're too busy creating institutions after our own self. We're creating bastards, the Lord told me. He said that there are ministries that are creating themselves. They're reproducing after their own kind. Truly, let me say this to you. For those of you who are looking for blessings from God, every blessing, everything from God is great. We know that. Every seed reproduces after its own kind. And I just want to tell you this. Every seed reproduces after its own kind. So I tell people this. If you give kisses, you're going to get kisses back. If you get hugs and people hug on you and love on you and you love on them, you're going to get that back. But if you're looking for finances, you're looking for money... Every seed reproduces after its own kind. You have to sow in money to begin to receive money. You've got to sow in money to receive money. So the same way that this goes, as the seed goes into the ground, it reproduces after its own kind. So when ministries are saying to follow me, not follow me as I follow Christ, but they're saying, follow me, recreate your ministry after me. There's so many ministries that you go from one place to the next and they all look the same. They're all saying the same. They're like, this month is this month. And I'm like, wait a minute, I visited this church a couple weeks ago. They said the same thing and, and y'all have the same banners up and y'all keep saying the same leaders. And where is Jesus in this? Can I ask you, where's Jesus in this? You know, where's your independent word from the Lord? Are you hearing leaders, pastors, are you hearing from the Lord? Are you hearing from man? And I know men are great. Don't give me wrong. Men and women of God are wonderful. I'm not de-elevating them. But what I'm saying is nobody's greater than Jesus. And nobody's greater than God. And nobody's greater than this word. So at the end of the day, your, your extra words, your rhema word of your own that you got from God is nice and good. But if it doesn't align with this word of God, then I'm not trying to hear you. So I'm, I'm making this very clear. So the Lord was telling me lots of ministries are no longer reproducing after Christ. They're reproducing after themselves. So we see a lot of bastard ministries. And I'm going to say it just like the Lord said it. Because when he said it, I said, Lord, that's a harsh word. He says, no. He said, but they're illegitimate. They're illegitimate. They're not founded upon me. They're not founded upon the rock. They're not founded upon me. They're illegitimate. They're bastards. If you did not partner with the Holy Spirit, if you did not get your mandate from the Lord God Almighty, then you are a bastard in ministry. I'm saying that to even you ministry gifts. If God didn't give you a mandate, if he did not speak it to you, if he did not blow his spirit on the inside of you, you're operating out of order. Amen. 
Amen. Ah, hallelujah. And so we've talked about the alignment, the apostolic alignment in order to cause uh, the kingdom to be advanced. And I've given you that. So now we have that structure. So now that we understand the Lord God Almighty is relational. His intention was that we would be connected. His, the Lord's true prayer was the last prayer that he prayed, which was about us. The true Lord's prayer is John 17, where his prayer was that we would be as one. His last prayer, the last prayer that he prayed for the people collectively was that we would be as one as he and the Father are one. He expects us to be unified. He expects us to work together. But how can we when we don't understand our calling? But how can we work together and align ourselves together when we're so busy being covetous over other people's gifts? When I'm so busy worried about the way you prophesy and God, I wish I could prophesy. I don't prophesy like her, God. and I don't feel like I'm a real prophet because I don't prophesy like she does. And, and God, you know, if I just prophesy like for an hour like she did, then I would really be a real prophet. God said, I made you all uniquely different for the calling upon your life. Did you hear me about the assignment? For the assignment that's upon your life, you will not sound like anybody else. You will not prophesy or walk the same way someone else does. God made you uniquely you for a purpose that only you can fulfill. Now, if you abdicate, if you abdicate that responsibility, come on, if you abdicate that responsibility, you leaving a hole in the unity of God. We're all to lock arms together. And what happens if we all decide, I got to be your gift. I don't like my gift. I'm just a teacher. And that ain't really no good gift. I want to be an apostle. So now what happens to the teachers? How can the people hear? How can they understand? How can they divide his word? Right? How can they um, follow his word? How can they apply it to, a, to, to their life if they don't have teachers? And if you decide, I want to be a prophet, I don't want to be a pastor, you know, everybody's a pastor, I don't want to be a pastor, I want to be a prophet now. Now, so where's the nurturing, the guarding of the sheep? Where's the protection? Where are those that are gatekeepers? Where are those that will keep the wolves out? Because nobody wants to be a pastor anymore, everybody wants to be a prophet. So I'm saying, every gift must give supply, every joint must give supply, we all work together. Explore the gift God gave you. As I said, many of you have yet to open up the gift under the tree, which is the gift that God placed on the inside of you. Many of you have yet to open the gift. You've yet to ask him, God, what did you call me to do? But many of you, I'm so sorry, how, why am I going down this road? But many of you want to ask somebody else. Many of you want to go up to a prophet. Tell me what the Lord said I'm supposed to do. And let me tell you, it's out of order. Why? Because God is going to speak to you first. And I'm not saying that every word that you receive is confirmation. Every prophetic word is not confirmation. Sometimes the Lord does bring you some information you didn't know, some direction you had not thought about. But I'm saying to you as it relates to your gifting and your calling, because he called who? He called you. So he's not going to run and tell a prophet something that he has not already spoken to you. So when a prophet speaks mostly about your calling, right, about what God has said, God has already spoke that thing to you. Now, whether you accept it or not is a question. Whether you received it when he said it or not, that's a question. Because when God says, I called you as a pastor, I'm thinking, oh, no, you didn't. You're talking to somebody else, Lord. I ain't trying to hear that. So then when someone prophesies, I, I see this maternal thing. God is, the Lord is saying you're, mo you're the mother of Zion. God, God is saying you're the mother of Zion. I'm like, what am I, why, are, why do people keep coming with me with this, with this word? But God already spoke it to me, right? I didn't want to hear it, but he already spoke it to me. Are you hearing me? Ooh, okay. Ooh, you know what? Someone asked me to transfer what's in me into them, really. my oh, Yes. Yes, know who you are. And let me say this about people who say, please put your spirit on me. The spirit that you have, I want the same spirit. Let me say this. It is not yours to give. The anointing on your life is not yours to give. It's God's to give. And God will tell you the people to lay hands upon. God told me about one lady to lay your hands upon her. Impart the spirit that's on you to teach. He said it specifically. He didn't just say lay hands on her. He said, I want you to activate on the inside of her, turn it on, that gift of teaching that's on the inside of her through the gift that's on the inside of you. So God was very specific, very specific. So had someone come and approach me and says, I want the anointing that's on your life, lay your hands upon me. I would say, whoa, listen, you need to seek God. It's not my gift to give. It belongs to him. So you need to seek him for yourself and seek him what gift he has for you. Who knows the measure of grace upon your life may even be greater than mine. So don't seek where I am. And at the end of the day, let me say this to people. Oftentimes when we do covet someone else's gift, we don't know what they had to go through to get it. 
So you ready to go through um, adultery? You ready to go through a loss of a child? You ready to go through a crippling illness? You ready to go through lesbianism? You ready to go through, you know, um, you know what I'm saying? Are you, are you willing to go through cancer? Are you willing to go through any of these things that people have had to go through to get the anointing on their life? Are we willing to? And many of us, let's be honest, no, I ain't trying to go through that, Lord. So let me be thankful right where I am with the gift that's upon my life right now. Because let me tell you, salvation is free, but the anointing costs. No, they don't know your price. They don't know the price that you had to pay, that you decided to pay. And some things that the Lord just made you pay. <laughs> some things he just made you pay. And so I say that to say that we need to be so very cautious when we covet somebody else's gift. Amen. All right, so I said Christ is relational. He made us to go together. But the major issue is that because many do not know what they've been called to do, they've been left out. We start with this lovely scripture that um, just really touches my heart um, about occupy. Have you heard this phrase? Occupy. Occupy until I come. That is what the Lord said. Yes, can you handle what I went through, really? And let me tell you, Denise, a uh, no. And am I pronouncing your name right? I know I'm, I know I'm mispronouncing it, so please tell me if, it, if it's Denise. Yes, they, they, they can't pay that price, and they would not want to. And nor would we want them to, at the end of the day. And not, not because we're concerned about where we are in the hierarchy, right? But we would want people to go through some of the same things we went through. That's why we tell them, thank you, Denise. That's why we tell them, listen, here's my journey. And maybe I can tell you this so you can avoid some of the pitfalls that I found myself in. Amen? Okay, so occupy. What's this word occupy mean? You find this in Luke 19. So as we're talking about advancing the kingdom, we need to understand what it means to do the work we've been called to do. So I'm starting at this place, even beyond the identity. God has called us to do a work. He says to occupy until I come. Now we know this is the 10 minas. We know this as the uh, the 10 um, parables. We understand or the 10 um uh, we know this is a parable of the ten servants or the ten minus, however you want to think of it. The Lord said to occupy until I come. And I want to get you to the heart of this message. Luke 19, 13 says, so he called ten of his servants and he gave them ten minas. And he says, put this money to work until I come back, right? Or he said, occupy until I come. So when we look at that scripture, um, it, it, what, what stands out to me and what makes it very clear is the fact that what he's saying to them, there's something that you've been called to do. There's something that you've been called to do while you're here and as a servant of God. So when we look at several translations in the English standard, it says, he said to them, engage in business until I come. Do business until I come. Right? He says to put this money to work. Now, he's not talking about true money. What he's talking about is this Grace gift that he's placed on the inside of you. This gift that he's given you. Right? The gift that we have in earthen vessels. This dispensation of his spirit. This strength, this embodiment, this gift, this charisma on the inside that he's given us. This Holy Spirit power and gift on the inside that he's given us to do work. He says, put it to work. So while you're here, don't sit on your gift. can be difficult if you don't know what your gift is. So what he's saying is, Engage in business. And what business is he in? Of saving souls. Of, uh, of edifying the body. Of lifting up and exhorting his people. Of giving comfort to those who mourn. That's what he did. He went about doing the good work. He went about speaking the good news. So guess what? I don't have time to comment on the same-sex marriage. I don't have time to really comment right on what's happening with the Pope coming. Guess what? Because I'm, the, I'm advancing the kingdom. And, the, and it's sort of like when you think about the wheat and the tear growing together. The Lord is going to allow good and evil to continue to grow together. So if I spend all of my energy fighting this thing that's going to remain until the end of time, then I have missed my opportunity, my appointment, my assignment, my access, the advancement I'm supposed to give, the establishment of the apostolic, and the kingdom. I've missed it. I've missed it. And I'm not to say that to these things are good, but what I'm saying is if I spend time attacking this, I've missed my mission. I've missed my call. I've missed my assignment. Come on. Right? So my job is let them grow together in the midst of this glory that God has given us. I'm going to continue to press forward. I'm going to continue to, to help the body. I'm going to continue to undergird them and support them because that's what I'm called to do. So for you, Wanda, that we're talking about the prophetic and you said that you believe that Lord, the Lord may be calling you to the apostolic. For those of you who were not on the periscope earlier, you, you missed this, but 
But I understand that. I understand that because the Lord has me as an apostolic pastor. It doesn't make sense to anyone, but he has me as a sent one. He doesn't have me to establish a brick and mortar yet in this season. He may and he may not. And guess what? It doesn't matter to me because why? I'm doing my assignment. And in the midst of my assignment, let me tell you, there's fulfillment there. Where God has you assigned what he's given you authority to do, he's given you fulfillment in that thing. So as I'm supporting ministries, as I'm helping people with curriculum, as I'm praying for, for uh, people on the phone and I'm reaching out to people daily and weekly, God is giving me what I need. He's giving me what I need because he has me sent out to help ministries, to build up the body. An apostolic call. It doesn't mean I'm an apostle, but it means I have an apostolic call, and that's where I am now. Just like I'm not a prophet, but I flow prophetically. Amen? Amen. Okay. So the heart of this message and the three things I wanted to say to you um, was about how we understand our gift. Knowing our gifts, knowing what they are, number one. Knowing what they are, knowing how to wield our gifts, and knowing when and where, knowing when and where to wield our sword or our gift. God will not, sorry guys, God would not have us ignorant, right, of the gifts that he's placed on the inside of us. So remember, this is a three-part message. The first one I already did that was sort of talking about Jesus as a master builder. And I loved how I just, how the Lord just gave me this image of him as this master contractor. And he sets general contractors under him, right? So he's the management firm. And because he was so multidimensional, he was so multi-talented, he was so, um, you know, multi-gifted that he could not pull all of himself into one gift. So he separated himself into five gifts. And so I talked about that. And today we're talking about knowing your gifts and how to wield them and knowing your sphere of influence. And then tomorrow, well, maybe tomorrow. Why did I say that? We, who knows? We'll see. The third part will come. And so it might be tomorrow. The third part, y'all going to love. Because the third part is called Jesus I know, but who are you? Ha! Okay, I'm excited about that one. So that's a good one. And I'm going to break down a little bit for you of some words of understanding what this scripture means. But anyway, so the third part is going to say, uh, is about Jesus I know, but who are you? So really, do you know who you are? And guess what? Does the enemy know your name? Does the enemy know you? When you get up in the morning, does the enemy say, oh, crap, she got up again? Right? When you start praying for someone, does the enemy say, man, she, man, thwarted our plans. Come on, demons. Come on back. She got the victory. She's got the victory. Let's come on back. Right? Does the enemy know you? And that's what we're going to talk about probably tomorrow, but I will let you know. Come on. That's it. All right. So here's what I want to share with you. 2 Corinthians 10, 12 through 17. Now, what we're talking about here and what I want to set up for you to know and to understand, I'm going to say this one quick word about leaders. Um, you know, Apostle Greg really shared a lot about the, uh, the heart of the Father, which was awesome. Leaders create other leaders. Leaders do not create followers, right? Leaders do not create followers. They create other people who will lead other people. Are you, are you hearing me, right? And think about it this way. You can lead at any level of an organization. You can lead as the person who is cleaning the toilets in the church. You can lead yourself. So, so understand what I'm saying. I'm not saying that a leader is creating someone in a complete succession line that they would now become king. That's not what I'm saying. But they create leaders. They create people who are not crippled, people who are not anemic, people who are not dependent upon them. Are you hearing me? Leaders create people who are independent thinkers and who can receive something from God. Are you hearing me? And who can hear for themselves. I'm going to train you and teach you how to hear God for yourself, right? That way you won't be calling me at 3 o'clock in the morning, 5 o'clock in the morning all the time saying, what is God saying? You can hear for yourself. I need to train you. Leaders do not create followers. They create leaders. Amen. Amen. Now, so what I said about leaders is they set the tone. They set the pace and the heart for the work they expect from those that they lead. They set the tone. And how do you set the tone? You go first. You go first. You give first. You share first. You pour first. You sacrifice first. You build first. You don't say, hey, sow into my ministry. You say, I'm going to sow into you. They pray for people first. They don't ask for prayer first. They serve first. Are you hearing me? Jesus is our example. I know you may say this sounds heretical. This, this, this doesn't sound like the Lord. No, it's, this is real. Right? This is real. You serve first. First. It says, then you will know, um, then the people that you're, that you're serving, they will know then how, to, how they should lead. They lead by example. 
right? Follow the leader. You remember that as a kid? Follow the leader. Or Simon says, if I do this, you do this, right? So follow the leader. Do exactly what they do. So if I don't see it, if I don't see you serving, if I don't see you giving, if I don't see you pouring, if I don't see you, right, praying, if I don't see you doing any of these things, I won't think I need to do it. And, and I said this on my Periscope a few weeks back. What bothers me a lot is in ministry when I see pastors and ministers, those who are going to preach the word of God, who don't come out until a little bit after the worship. They come out like right before offering or right after the offering or something like that. And I wonder, why are you sitting back in that room when worship is going forward? The people need to see you worship too. They won't know that they should worship. They may be really worshipers and all of a sudden they look at their leader who's not lifting their hands, who's not praising the Lord. And they say, oh, I guess when I become a leader, I'm supposed to be more reserved. So you're going you're gonna to see me if you call me to your church. I'm going to lay on my face. You'll see me. That's usually me. Me bent over, my, knee, my, my, my nose on my knees usually. And then eventually I make my way to the floor because I love worship. And so guess what? Then I show the people that she, she, she submitted to God. She's seeking God. She's seeking his face. You know, I'm going to give God my worship. All right. And so here's the thing I want to say to pastors who've been hurt, who say, I've been, I've been abused. I've been stabbed in the back. I've been talked about. Yes. Sheep have abandoned you. They've lied on you. They've, they've misrepresented your relationship with them. They've said you've done stuff that you haven't. They've used you. They have abused you. Hey, but unless they crucified you on a cross, can you compare your suffering to that? Has it gotten to that point yet that they're, they're drawing blood from you? So, I mean, it's hard, to, it's, it's hard to swallow that. But leaders who say, I've been abandoned, I've been abused, I, I've gone through all these things, but, you know, this is what's happened to me. Yes, but measure your level of suffering, leaders that have experienced that, by the suffering of the cross. In the midst of the cross, when we look at the cross of what Jesus endured, knowing people were spitting at him, throwing stuff at him, that they had beat him up, yet he still died for us. So I say that to leaders who say, I've been hurt by the sheep. I've been stabbed in the back. I've gone through all of these things. I say, yes, yes, they've done that. But unless they've crucified you on a cross, unless you've been lifted up that way, unless you, you've been shot at, Measure your suffering by the cross. We can't. We can't. So that's my word for leaders. Okay. Let's get to this knowing your gifts. Amen. Amen. Y'all still with me? You still with me? All right. So you're with me? Amen. Okay. So there's an importance of intercession in your life, and that's prayer. Prayer, prayer, prayer. Now, the Bible says, you know, you, you understand like when we fast, I believe fasting should be a part of your life. It should just be a part of your life. But it says when you pray. So there's an expectation that you're going to pray, right? And, and then it talks about even when you fast, right? Not letting people see that you're fasting. So I say this intercession is a part of what we've been called to do. It is our relationship, our fellowship with the master. We must pray. We must connect. And we must intercede for others, right? We're not, no one is going to get there, meaning the kingdom, get to heaven by themselves. And what I'm saying is, yes, it's between you and the Lord, but we want to take other people with us. Are you hearing me? And the kingdom doesn't advance through one person. The kingdom is advanced by us locking arms, joining together. All right, so let me stay on task. Let me stay on task. Okay, so when we're talking about coming into maturity, one of the things I want to say to you clearly is knowing and understand your gifts. How do you begin to know and understand your gifts? We find in Ephesians 4, it talks about growing into maturity. It talks about understanding the gifts that we've been called to do. Hebrews tells us that we need to leave the elementary doctrine, right, of Christ and go on into maturity. We must just leave the fact that I know I'm saved and go on to knowing him even the more. And as I said to you before, open the gift under the tree. Open the gift that God gave you on the inside. Begin to ask him. Don't ask a, a leader or a prophet to say, what gift do I have? Ask the Lord. And let me use for an example for me. God began to speak to me early in my life, but I didn't necessarily know what my gift was. But when I saw my relationships with people in school, I was always the, 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 the defender of the broken. I was the defender of the person who was left alone. I was the defender of the person at the, at the, at the playground who nobody talked to. That was me. So I'm like, oh, no one's talking to this person. I'm going to go there. Oh, someone made this person feel bad. Let me go over there. This was me as a child. 
So when I be around people, I was never a follower. I was always a leader, but I was not a leader for bad. So I wasn't leading people to do crazy stuff. But I was always independent. But I was always that one. Anyone who was outcast, who was abandoned, who was rejected by other people, I would always go and try to minister something, try to say something nice to connect with them so they wouldn't feel so bad. That's the pastor call. That's the heart, the burden of the pastor on the inside of me, that I love God's people. I love the sheep. And I'm the one that will go back for that one. And everyone's like, leave that one alone, man. She ain't going to ever get right. She ain't going to do right. I'm like, no, you don't know her. You don't know her story. You don't know what she's been through. You don't know what men had did to her. You don't know who broke her down. No, she is salvageable. I'm going back to get her. You know, man, don't mess with that brother, man. He's out there selling weed, man. You don't want to spend your time with him. No, that man has a great call on his life. And God is calling him to be an entrepreneur in the kingdom of God. He's going to be a marketplace pastor. And I'm telling you, I'm going back after him. That was me. So I say for those of you who are still trying to figure out what your calling is, look over your life. See the things that you've done. Take a spiritual gift assessment just to start. There are many of them that are online that you can take that will give you an idea. And then what I say is submit that to your leadership. Say, here are the things that this assessment have said about me, have identified maybe some areas in my life. I want to develop these more. Are you hearing me? So I'm going to submit it to my leadership that they might weigh it and they might determine. So I'm never going to leave pastors out of this conversation. So for those who are renegades and want to run wild, this is not the periscope for you. Because I'm never going to release the sheep to just go run rampant. That's not how Jesus did it. He protected them. But where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So there's no bondage in the relationship. Are you hearing me? So for leaders, that means I leave you free to find God and to find your relationship with him and the intimacy with the Lord on your own. But I'm leading you. And I'm guiding you and I'm giving you some parameters and some guards to keep you safe, to keep you safe, not to bind you, not to oppress you, right? Not to push you down, not to put more on you than you can bear, right? But to elevate you, right? To sharpen you as a tool, to make you ready for what God has for you, for the assignment upon your life. That's what the pastors are set to do. Okay, so knowing your gifts, I'm saying what you have to do is to begin to understand it. Ask the Lord. Take a spiritual gift assessment. Spend a little time discovering who you are. Say, Lord, who am I? Lord, who did you make me be? Oh, you know I'm going to get him, Denise. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not fooling with rene renegades and, and rebels. No. You know, and we can feel that way a little bit in our spirit sometimes when you minister. You know, you can feel a little rebellious sometimes. But I'm saying if you're entire nature is not to submit yourself to any authority then you know that's not how God would want you to be because even as a child right in your in your parents house even if you didn't have a, a both parents you had a mother or you had a father or you had a grandmother or whoever watched over you they gave you boundaries they gave you parameters to keep you safe and that is what God intends to do with authority over you to keep you protected to launch you out to press you into your destiny are you hearing me okay so number two, we talked about knowing and understanding your gifts. Yes, we must have accountability. Second is knowing how to wield your gifts. Are you hearing me? Knowing how to wield your gifts. And in that, I want to share with you um, a well-known scripture. Oftentimes, I think leaders come, come to a place where they think that they have authority over every area. Area, right? So if I'm a if I'm a pastor, everywhere I go, I'm a pastor. Let me use for an example my mother. My mother's an apostle. Many people on this don't know this because I don't really talk about titles a lot with even my family members. My mother is an apostle. And so understanding her calling and her gift, she's not an apostle everywhere she goes. Now, that's her title, but does she have the authority everywhere that she goes? No, because there's regional leaders. There's governmental leaders in particular areas. So while she's been called an apostle in, you know, in her area and what she does in her churches in Africa and all of that, Right. If she came to Texas, there are leaders in this area. There are leaders in this area who have the apostolic call on their life. So she can't come in and supersede them. She'll always be an apostle. No doubt. God never removes the gift and the mantle upon her life. But she doesn't have the regional authority here. She can always go places as people open and access or as God sends her out. Do you hear me? Let me clarify. Right? That's what I was going to say. Yes. Unless God sends her out. Yes, that's my point. Church planting. So I feel, um, in terms of apostles, how do I feel about church planting? So I wonder what you mean. Um, yes, governmental order. So how do I feel about church planting? I, I guess, I don't know if you're asking me about 
pastors planting churches or apostles planting churches. Um, I do believe that that apostles do set ministries. And we talked about that yesterday. Apostles set ministries in order, but then they leave leadership there. So in general, the apostle does not run that ministry that they planted. They have set in order pastors to take care of that ministry. And that's what I see. Apostles govern. So in some senses, you see apostles in a house, but a lot of them are very frustrated. Apostles speak up. They're frustrated when they're in a house and they're just ministering, you know, in, in, in a pastoring. Because God has sent them out. God has called them to take new territory. He's called them to pluck up and root out, right, and to establish new ministries. So church planting for them would be what they would do. I don't think pastors tend to plant churches uh, without an apostolic work being done. Okay, so that's my short take on that. All right, so knowing how to wield your gifts. Um, I was in the middle of sharing something with you. I want you to go to 2 Corinthians, and if you, even if you don't, you know I'm going to read it anyway. 2 Corinthians 10. 13 through 17. So 2 Corinthians 10, actually 12 through 17, it talks about, I love this because it really talks about having a lack of understanding, that there are leaders that are comparing themselves with other people, right? They're co commending themselves, patting themselves on the back. We're doing such a great job. Look at us as comparison to that church. Let's look at us in comparison to the Baptist church. Oh, we're doing so much better because we're apostolic. Oh, well, we're, um, we're doing so much better because we're Pentecostal. When people are comparing ministries to other ministries, and I love this in 12 because 13, he says, but we will not boast beyond our limits. It says, but we'll boast only with regard to the area of influence God assigned to us to reach even to you. So God has given each and every one of us a, a sphere of influence. So in knowing how to wield our gifts, we're learning how to utilize the gift that God gave, gave us. When he gave you the gift that he gave you, he gave you instructions. They came with instructions of how to do it. And all over Proverbs, we see that it's a fool who, dis, who despises wisdom and who despises instruction. There's Prosperity and success coming when we heed, listen, and accept instruction. So God gave you instructions about the gift, how to wield your gift. Are you teachable? Are you teachable? As a child sits at the foot of God ready to absorb every word that comes out of his mouth as a sponge, are you teachable? Right? So how you know your gift, begin to understand it, you seek God about that, then how do you wield your gifts? You wield it with instruction. You ask the Lord, is this how I should wield my gift? Is this how I should utilize my gift? Remember I said the difference between engagements and assignments. If I know it's an assignment, then I know God is going to give me the way that I need to use my gift and what he needs to do. So with me, sometimes, give me a second. Sometimes the Lord will say, you're walking in the prophetic today. And I'm like, okay. And I mean, literally as I'm there, I'm like, okay, I came to teach. I came to teach. And as I'm trying to teach, I get antsy. And before I know it, I'm walking around uh, uh, the altar and then I'm starting to talk to people directly. And I'm like, why? Because I, I have all these notes. Cause you know, I'm a teacher. I'm like, how all these notes, Lord, but he wanted to use me in the prophetic. Okay. So I flow in the prophetic. Another place I'll go and the Lord will show me in my notes, no, I want you to talk about their heart. I want you to talk about where they've been hurt. I want you to minister to that on the inside of them. So it gives me an opportunity to call people forward who've been brokenhearted, who've been torn down, who've been talked about, right? And so he said, I want you to walk in the beauty of Christ today. I want you to walk as a pastor today. I want you to minister to my sheep. And so in the midst of it, I can't bring a harsh word of correction or rebuke because God is saying, no, minister to where they've been broken. They've been rebuked enough. Now come and bring refreshing. Come and bring those fresh wind. Come and give them encouragement. Exhort them. Comfort them right now. And so God has me walk that way. So I'm listening and say, okay, God, the gifts on the inside, how do I wield them today? Yes, listen for full instructions. Because he's going to tell you, this is how I want to use you. So as I'm doing, I'm studying your word, oh God. Now that I've studied, I've made myself ready. Now empty me out and allow me to walk in your spirit. Are you hearing me? Okay. Amen. All right. So lastly is the knowing where and when to wield your sword or gift. So as we were reading, he says we will not extend ourselves um, beyond our borders. It says in 14, this is 2 Corinthians 10 and now 14. For we are not extending ourselves as though we did not reach you. For we were the first to come all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. It says we do not boast beyond limit in the labors of others. So that means I don't take credit in the areas where other people are ministering and doing what they're doing. Which also to me means I'm not coveting someone else's gift. 
So if the Lord had me to preach and I did what I did and someone else came or someone came before me and they ministered in the prophetic and whatever, I don't get up and start saying, well, I can do that too. No, I'm going to do what God called me to do. Are you hearing me? So I can be effective. It says, but our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged. So what this means is the sphere of influence the Lord has given you, the sphere around you, those people that he's called you to minister to, right? Those places, be it your job, your community, your house, where he's called you to minister to, the place where he's enlarged you, the place where he's given you authority and power, your assignment is your sphere of influence. That's where he's given you authority. In that place that he's given it to you, that is where he's going to cause you to operate. And that is where he's going to enlarge your territory. Remember, I've said this before. As God enlarges your territory, what that means is not to feel exalted. It is not about finances really coming to you. What it is is that God is going to give you greater provision for this greater greater area of territory he's given you. So as he enlarges your territory, he is saying, I'm going to fill you up, right? That your cup might overflow. So as I pour down into you what you need, then I'm going to fill you to overflowing. That way you have more to give to your sphere of influence. Are you hearing me? So when we ask God enlarge my, tour, my territory, remember, to say God enlarge my territory means that God not only increase me, but increase my ability to share with others, increase my ability to give to others, uh, increase my ability to sow in to somebody else, increase my ability to give to somebody else. Are you hearing me? The overflow is not for you. Oh, I'm in the overflow. I'm living in the overflow. We can sing that song all day long. I'm sorry, y'all. You know, I'm living in the overflow. We can do that all day long. But the overflow is not for you. Now that your cup is full, that's for you. But the overflow is for somebody else. Amen? Okay, so when, when I'm asking you the question of, do you know when and where you should operate your gift? How you wield your sword? Amen. Bless you, Kendra. Where are you operating? Are you operating at your church? Are you operating, you know, um, under divine borders and, and boundaries? Under divine authority? Has God sanctioned you in these areas? Has he proved you? Has he sharpened you as a tool in these areas? Two, you need to learn how to rest and know when to war. Know the difference between those times and periods. Someone admonished me that years ago. They said, listen. Oh, wow. Oh, that's okay. Oh, thank you. Oh, she lost, she lost her, her sight and had to start all over again. Okay, bless you, Susan. Good to see you. Know when to rest and when to war. Bless you. When to rest and when to war. Right? Know when to rest. There's sometimes that God says, this fight is not yours. This battle is not yours. Sit. Sit and watch my glory. So while you're trying to fight and battle and you're trying to make phone calls, you're trying to pray down heaven, you're trying, God said sleep. He says rest. He says, I got this. This is not your battle. Sit out. Sit out this one. Sit down. Right? We need to know the difference. And I'm telling you, there's sometimes battles will come against you. And you're like, immediately, I'm starting to speak in tongues. I'm starting to call things down. I'm trying to tear things down. And God said, no, sit this one out. Rest. Rest. God will have you be the one that's drinking lemonade in the corner while everybody around you is going crazy. He will have folks pulling out their hair. People trying to call the bells bondmen. People, people trying to sell their house. Right? And God said, sit still. I got this one. And everyone's like, why are you not worried? Why are you not going off? Everyone's upset about this. Are you, you know, what are you doing? And you're like, God said he's got it. And I trust him. He told me to rest. I know. You know, and everyone's like, I don't get it. Everybody else is going off and everyone's going crazy and everybody's calling everybody. But the Lord said rest. And you need to know when to rest and when to war. And I know for me, I would always war, no matter what. I was like, I'm Joshua and Caleb down in the battle. And the Lord said, no, sometimes I just want you to sit it out. I want you to watch. I want you to be that servant that looked around and said, there are more, there are more for us than against us. Yes, they think you're going nuts. They think you've lost it, Sky. They think you've lost it. They're like, how could you? You know, if you take a minute and if you sit back and you just get silent all of a sudden, you stop answering phone calls, you stop answering emails, right? You, you block them on Facebook or you shut down Facebook for a season. You say, I'm taking a break. And they're like, what happened? Have you lost it? And you're like, no, God said rest. He said, I'm going to, I'm going to bring you by, right? I'm going to have you walk by these still quiet waters, this, this place of rest, this place of peace. I'm going to cause you to lay down in, in sweet valleys and meadows. That, that's what God wants to do. He said, when you rest in me and you find your, you, you lay your head in his lap, he, daddy says, I got it. 
He said, I got this. Right. And, and a child that trusts in, you know, in him like that. He's like, oh, you know, I got it. Because if you can sit in the midst of the battle and lay there and say, I'm not even going to worry about it. God has got this so well in hand. I'm at peace. You know, it will it will cause people to wonder if you've lost your mind. OK, the last is when are you operating? Are you giving yourself a season for recovery? So after God has been using you mightily, are you taking time to replenish yourself? Are you taking time to just bask in his presence? Allow him to fill you up again. And as I said, and I've said thousands of times, I'm telling you, um, our first task as ministers of the Lord, all ministers, our task is to be with him first, to be with him. And what does that mean? It doesn't mean I'm asking him for something. It doesn't mean I'm looking for his hand. It's I'm looking for his face. I just want to be in his presence. Our first task is just to be with him. Are you spending time with him? So after you minister and you pour out Jesus, God said, then come back to me. Let me replenish you. Let me restore you. Let me revive you. Let me fill you up so that you can then be able to pour out again. I don't know how to pray. Prayer, um, Eric's prayer is just talking to the Lord. It's communication. You know, and, and there's some people that pray mightily and have an anointing and, and the way that they pray, it just sounds really powerful. But prayer is just communicating with the Lord. Simply to say, you know, Father God, you know, I need you right now. I don't know what I'm going through. This doesn't make any sense to me. But God, you know all things. I trust you. And what I use for an example is this. First thing you do if you're, if you're doing a prayer, if you're trying to model a prayer, first thing is praise. If you want to come into his presence, come into his presence with praise, right? Enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Right. So begin to pray, 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 begin to pray. So so and you praise him, exalt him, tell him how tell him who he is to you. And what I tell people is write down who he is to you, because who he is to you may not be who he is to me. Right. So if for you, he might be um, a healer. And maybe I have not really been really sick or dealt with um, a healing in a major way. So I may not say that. But whatever he's been in your life, I mean, he has been a healer. But I'm saying using that for an example, what has he been in your life? For me, I say, you know, God, you're a, yes, and that's writing. That's how I started. There was a season I actually wrote my prayers down. Yes, and I wrote them down so that I could see them. And so start with praise. You know, God, you are awesome. You're mighty. You're a hiding place, I say to him. I say, God, you're a resting place. You're my shield and my, my defense. You're my buckler. God, you're my laying down and my waking up. God, you are my strength. You are my redeemer. You are Hosanna, which is deliverer. You are my deliverer. God, you are you're a God. You're mighty. You're awesome. You're powerful, God. You are, you are faithful, God. You are righteousness, God, to me. You are my love and my life, Adonai. You are the many-breasted one. You are, um, you know, you are my redeemer. Redeemer, you're El Shaddai, right? So I just begin to call on the names of the Lord. You can even go do a Google search on the names of God and, and it will listen to you. It will list you a lot of them and just begin to call him what he is to you. So start with that, with that praise, right? And then you can move on from there to, to talking to him about where you are and what, maybe what you're dealing with. And usually what I do at that point is I pray for other people. So I do intercession. I start praying for other people. And God, this is what other people are dealing with. And I start there. And then I finally get to my request. And here's what I need. You know, here's what's going on with me. You know, but somewhere in there, I'm asking for forgiveness. I'm asking God to cleanse me, to make me righteous before him. Right, that I would put on his righteousness. That every dark and dirty thing in me would like would be purged. Right, so that I would be a, a vessel fit for his use. That I would be pure and holy like him. And that, right, I would be able to uh, send this prayer up. And that it would be um, a beautiful savor unto him. That it would be a wonderful smell in his nostrils. Right, that's what I begin to pray. Right, so you just, you just do that. And the Lord's Prayer, I would say... The Lord's Prayer is, is a model prayer. The true Lord's Prayer is, in, we, we know already, it's like John 17. But the model prayer that says, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, all of that is a model. It's a model to follow. So you can even put that down on a page and then write your own words where it says, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You'd say, you know, God, you are a God that, that, that sits high yet looks low. You are enthroned. You are, the, you are the lamb that was slain before the foundations of the world. You, you know, just... You can use that as a model prayer. Okay? Amen? All right. Let me finish this last thing because I don't want to belabor the time. Lastly, I, I want you to understand God has given each one of us a sphere of influence. He's given us a place of power and authority and dominion. He's given that for us. Amen? 
Amen. And so now I'm letting you know, though, in the midst of your sphere of influence, don't get it twisted. God can use anyone at any time. And he does. Right. But knowing whether this is your time to operate, knowing if he's called you to this particular task, it's critical. Right. In order for us to be walking in unity and walking in love, that means we must connect. That must mean I, I need to know you and how you operate, the gift on the inside of you. Do I need to know your phone number? Do I need to know whether I like your hairstyle? Do I, need, I don't need to know any of that. What I need to know is the Christ on the inside of you. And there are people who I personally, as a, as a, as a friend, you're not going to be my friend. There are people that you're not going to be my friend. I don't even know that I trust you, but I trust the God on the inside of you. There are some people that I work with that as a, as a person, I don't care for them. I'm being honest with you. I don't care for them, but I know the spirit on the inside of them. So if someone's looking for a, 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 for a true teacher, I would recommend them. I don't necessarily like them, right? Oh, bless you. Our life should be contagious. Oh, bless you, April. You know, but I'd say in the natural, when the spirit of God lifts, uh, I'm, 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 I'm heading out the door, right? So me and certain people, like when, when the spirit lifts off of them, no, we, we, we're not going to be friends. We're not going to hang out. We're not going to the same parties. I'm not inviting you over to my house. We ain't got to be friends, but we agree on Jesus Christ, him crucified, buried, and resurrected. We agree on that. We agree on advancing the kingdom. So when it comes to kingdom things, I'm going to work with you. Now, I don't have to like you. As a friend, I love you in Christ, but I recognize that maybe we don't get along so well. But at the end of the day, do I trust the Christ on the inside of you? When your gift comes forth, can I trust that? And if I can, then I can work with you. So for me, I don't try to get with people on the personal stuff. Like I might not like the fact that, you know, the person has blue hair and green hair. I may not like that they got a tattoo under their eye. I may not like that they wear skimpy clothes or that they wear a big robe or that they wear a collar. I may not like any of that. But at the end of the day, can we agree on Jesus Christ, him crucified, buried, and resurrected? Can we agree on the good news? Can we agree that his kingdom needs to be advanced? Can we agree that we got to get together and we got to be on one accord? Right? So I'm saying you don't have to love um, what people do. You don't have to like everybody, but you've got to love them in Christ and you've got to work together. Right? So there's some people, when it comes to the kingdom, we get along. But after that, when the spirit lifts, I'm like, okay, I'm good. I'm good. You know, so I say all this to say, know your gift, unwrap the gift under the tree that the Lord has given to you, the gift that he's placed on the inside of you, begin to inquire of that thing. Say, Lord, I know you gave me your spirit. I know that you've given me a dispensation of your gift. I know you've given me a portion of you on the inside. What is my gift? What is my calling? Begin to demand that that thing speak, that the gift will speak. Right? It says your gift makes room for you. Let that gift on the inside of you begin to speak. So compel it to speak. The gift on the inside, if you don't know, begin to ask God, what is the gift? Finding our gifts, how can we listen for that? Begin to see God. And I shared a little bit before, and I'll make this short, Sky. One of the things I said is I looked over my life, and what I found is that I've always been a pastor. That, that love for people who've been outcast, rejected, broken, abused, it's always been me. I was always the one that when everybody else would ignore the one person on the play, ground, I would always go over there and talk to them. When somebody would push someone down, I would jump in the front knowing I'm, I was, I'm five two. So little, little old short me would jump in the way, right? Would jump in the way. Yes, exactly right. That's my husband. A lot of times we're already walking the gift and we don't even know it. That is true. And so what I found is that all of my life, I was always trying to nurture and care for people and reach out to people. I was always a leader. I would always call people and, you know, gather them together. But I was very good one-on-one. -on -one. So when people were going through stuff, people would confide in me and share things that they could not believe that they shared. People would come back and say, I can't believe I just told you all my life. Oh, I can't believe I just shared that with you. they call me the next day. I'm so sorry. I just told you all my business. I'm like, it's okay. It, it, it's safe. And so that was who I, I, I was. And so when God finally called me as a pastor, it made sense. He began to give me scriptures. The Lord took me, in my case, he took me to Jeremiah 23 and he took me to Ezekiel 34 about the bad pastors, about the pastors who are causing the sheep to, to not grow to them. Uh, they're shearing off their fur and, and wearing them on their own garments. They're concerned about lucre, which is money being lucrative. They're concerned more about materialism than the sheep. They're not servants. They're actually trying to be served and lifted up. And God began to show me that. And I kept saying, why do you keep showing me that? He says, because I'm raising you up as a David. God is no respect of genders. He says, because I'm raising you up as a David. Because you're going to feed my sheep. Because you care about my sheep. I need, I need those who have a burden on the inside for my sheep. 
that are going to go after my sheep, even that one that's lost, they will go after them. And that's what I need. And so that's what God um, called me to. So I'm saying, look over your life. Look at what's there. But here's a helpful way. There are spiritual gift assessments that you could take. Now, I'm saying this in concert with your leadership. Are you hearing me? In concert, not with your best friend, not your homie, but your leadership. If there's at least one person in your leadership that you trust, that you think kind of has a sense of who you are, then after you take a spiritual gift assessment, take one or two, take it to them and say, here's what this says. And I want to begin to develop these gifts in my life. Show me how to do it. Amen. You know, so the idea is for you to seek God about it, right? Seek him about the gift. Ask him first. Ask him to confirm the gift on the inside of you. And I'm telling you, he's going to confirm. You're going to say, oh, I kind of always knew it. I kind of always knew that, that I, I had the gift of help. So I kind of always knew that I had the gift of mercy, which is really needed now. I kind of knew that I was an exhorter. I'm the person who's always encouraging. I'm the person that everyone wants to be around because I lift them up. I used to have people in my office at work all the time. They were waiting for a word. And I'd be like, why? I had one girl, <laughs> you'll love, she actually came to my office to make her personal phone calls. But literally, she said, your office is so peaceful. I'm like, it's not when you come in here and talk on your phone. But, okay, fine. But she would come in. She said, your office is just so peaceful. And she would sit in my office. And I had other students that would come in my office, and they would lay on my couch and go to sleep. So students would come in and lay on my couch and, and go to sleep and take a nap before their next class. Because I'm an exhorter. I came in and I encouraged them. Oh, people always write that out. Um, now, what was going on? I'm going to give you a short, short thing of that because I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. And I want to wrap this periscope up really quickly. But let me say this to you, Sky. People will always say uh, that women should not preach. But the word says that in that in the latter days that the Lord shall pour out his spirit upon his sons and daughters. Right. They shall prophesy. He said he's going to pour out his spirit. He is no respecter of persons. And let me tell you, I can take you way back to, to Genesis and the fact that he said, I created man and I made them male and female. He said, I created man and I made them male and female. I gave who dominion? He said, I have given them. Right. I've given them dominion. God gave us dominion. And a uh, point that I made, I had a I had a periscope for the daughters of Zion, which you would have loved to hear. And what I said to them is this. I said when he created them and then all of a sudden we see it, it says what said the curse for the man was that he was going to have to toil the land, you know, by the sweat of his brow. And he was going to come up with briars and all sorts of things that it wasn't going to uh, lend forth anything, any good seed. Right. Well, we know that that was lifted. Right. So we know that men work by the sweat of their brow. They still do, but they bring up harvest and everything happened. So we know that when Jesus came. Right. This curse was lifted. We, we, we know that we know that even before that time that that God began to deal with man differently. Right. So we know these things happen. And so we find in the New Testament where people say that now men are free to do so many things. No longer are they dealing with some of the things that they're dealing with. But I'm saying to you very clearly, if men are now free. Right. To produce the things that have God said that they can produce in the land, then why aren't women now free to do what we've been called to do? So God has raised us up together to co-labor. And in his word, he, they're just, he, he's raised us up to, to co-labor, not, not to usurp authority or for men to usurp authority over anyone. He made us a powerful combination to take dominion in the earth. He made us to take dominion in the earth. There's a work that we have to do and we cannot do it separately, right? God created man and woman and what he did was he gave us different characteristics. He made us differently, right? He didn't make us the exact same. So there's certain aspects. And I mean, and really, if you read this, Adam, when he was created, Adam had Eve on the inside. Adam had intuition. Adam had understanding. Right. And it wasn't until his rib was removed. Right. And created Eve that created something separate. Something from him was taken. That part of his intuition. Eve comes and Adam's been in the garden all this time. He ain't never saw no, no snake, no hide or hair. He ain't paid no attention to the serpent. Let me say that. The serpent. He paid no attention. Now all of a sudden the awareness, right? The, the realization, the understanding, right? Of Eve comes in and says, look at it. You see this thing over here? And Adam's like, what? Because that part of him, that intuition, that part of him was taken out. God intends us to co-labor. He intends it not to be simply just men or simply just women. He wants us to co-labor. And I could go on and on and on, but I won't on this one. Maybe another one. Okay. Bless you. All right. I'm wrapping up. 
I'm right. Oh, bless you, Sky. No, bless you. And I'm telling you, um, and, and it can't just be simply because so many women are being uh, raised up in this hour. What has happened in some cases, yes, people have said some men have set back. And sometimes um, uh, religion can cause things to be a certain way, right? Religion is not relationship. Religion says that things must be in the tradition that they've always been and they cannot shift and they cannot change. But God comes in to break up the fallow ground. He comes in to break up culture. God comes in to break up you know man's traditions and his ways of doing things God said didn't he say I, I use the foolish things to confound the wise so when people talk about how women are foolish God said yes I'll use that foolish thing to confound you who think you're so wise you think I would never use a woman God said he'll make a rock cry out are you hearing me so God will use the foolish thing so if he wants to call a woman foolish that's okay use me call me foolish but I but but I tell you I'm gonna speak in his wisdom are you hearing me so that's what I'm saying. God will not do things the way that people um, anticipate. And that's why many of us who've been broken and have been in hard places and, and have come from, from uh, small towns or come from broken marriages and come from these situations, come from a divorce, right? God is using us. And people are like, how is God using you? <laughs> because he does. He uses the foolish things. And that's okay. I'll be foolish for that reason. Amen. Oh, bless you, Sky. Bless you. Well, I'm telling you, I'm not going to stop. I'm not going to stop praying. I'm not going to stop preaching. I'm not going to stop doing what God has called me to do. And I know some people will be offended. All these things will happen. Yes, the woman at the well turned it upside down. You know, and of course, I think that men are attracted to women's anointing just as women are attracted to men's anointing. But that gets us off track. All right, y'all. I'm trying to wrap it up. I know my brother is either on already Periscope or he's waiting to come on. So I don't want to belabor the time. And I know this has been a great ministry day. Fill me up, God, with your Holy Spirit so I can pray in the spirit. Yes. And the scriptures actually say to build yourself up in your most holy faith, which is what? Speaking in tongues. So speaking in the spirit, praying in the spirit. So God is giving you power and authority when you pray in the spirit. When you pray in the spirit, the Holy Ghost hears you. God hears you and you bypass the ears of the enemy. I'm telling you, your prayer language, your connection with the Holy Spirit through your prayer, praying in the Spirit, it builds up your faith. I'm telling you, it gives you so much authority and so much power. So I, I just, bless you guys, speak what God puts on your mind. I, I'm telling you, um, I'm really excited. Let me, let me say this. I'm going to, for those of you who um, got on a little bit late, I want to give you the three, six points that I gave you in the beginning. Let me at least wrap you up with that. Um, and I love to say it again. Once again, when we think about advancing the kingdom, the five or six things that we want to keep in mind, and really it's seven, but I'm putting slash. I was raised Baptist, not learning about that growing up. Yes. And many of us didn't. And many of us didn't. I was raised Baptist too. I was too, where literally the Bible would collect dust until the next Sunday. Because who could understand it? I was like, who speaks in this language? And so let me mess up your theology. Jesus did not speak in King James. He did not speak in King James, right? He did not speak in New King James or the NIV, right? These are things that are our interpretations of the word and, and particularly um, a centuries known interpretations of the Bible. So in that century, King James was how people spoke, and that's what they put together. That makes sense. But understand that the Bible is set for us to, to, to receive, for us to chew. I, can't, I, I just want to say chew. I need to just say it. Chew. It's for us to, to uh, chew. So understand. You know, so I make it very clear to you that this Bible, if you do not understand it, you will never apply it to your life. You will never be able to walk it out. You must understand what it's saying. So please find a translation you can understand. English Standard Version is one of my favorites. NIV is pretty good. The Message Bible is completely, you know, it doesn't even have verses. <laughs> Message Bible has like paragraphs, but I'm saying find something you could read. And my best suggestion for those of you who are trying to grapple and understand the word of God is to have a parallel Bible. And of course, ask God for revelation. Usually what I do is I pray before I open up the word and say, God, you know, reveal, you know, your word to me. Reveal it and, and, and highlight what I need to know, you know, highlight what I need to know. You know, so I say a parallel Bible is great because you can have a King James version if that's what your church tends to use. And on the side, have the living Bible or have something else where you can understand it. I have several Bibles here. 
several. You know, so from the NIV to, to, I just have several, from commentaries to all sorts of things. That way I can dissect the word. And for me, that's why a lot of times when I read to you, yes, easy to read version. That's great. Yes. So, and don't feel ashamed to do that. Please do not feel like a lesser minister because you're reading an easy to read version. Or you're reading the NIV or you're reading the plain standard English version. Please do not feel like that's anything less. Yes, love my parallel. I loved it because when they would, they would read the King James in church and I'm like, I don't know what this says. I was able to look over and say, oh, that's what that means. And then I was able to apply it to my life. And it does. It helps fill in the basics or fill in the blanks of parts that we don't get. So please find a Bible that you can understand. The only way you're going to be able to share it with somebody else is if you can grasp it yourself. I truly do believe that true teachers aren't people who just learned it for themselves. When you become a real teacher and when you know you have real knowledge about something, it's when you can teach it to somebody else. You know what I mean? When you can teach it to somebody else, that means you really understand that thing. But if you can't explain, if you're like, well, I mean, um, the anointing is kind of like, um, I mean, it's like a wind and I mean, it's like when colors shift and like a building shakes and um, yeah, that's the anointing. Well, clearly you don't understand what the anointing is, right? You know, you know what I'm saying? So if you can't explain it to someone, that means you don't understand it yet. So, right? So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna grow up in the things of Christ. We're going to grow up in the word, right? We're going to grow up to the full measurement and stature. We're going to move beyond salvation and move to a deeper understanding of Christ. Amen. Thank you guys for the hearts. Y'all know, and I say this like this, don't let me offend anybody. I'm not a heart whore. So I never ask you guys, you guys for hearts. I appreciate it when you give them. I always appreciate when you give them. I love them when you give them, but I never ask for them because whether I get one or not, as long as God is pleased with what I've done and as long as you feel helped, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. So let me give you these six things or seven things so that you know. Oh, bless you. I received that sky. Thank you. And, I, and God loves you too. He loves you too. So very much. Oh, amen. I love you. That's my cousin. Jackie, that's my cousin. Bless you. So I'm going to give you these six points or really seven points. I'm going to give this to you. Bless you, lady. I bless you. Okay. So <clears throat> in order to advance the kingdom, what do we need? We need to come into agreement or alignment. Come into agreement and alignment, not or. Agreement and alignment with God. We need to come into agreement with him. This means to acquaint ourselves with him, right? To agree with him, to stop arguing with him, to stop fighting with him, right? To align ourselves with him, right? Amos 3 and 3. How can two walk together lest they be agreed? We need to get on one accord. Amen. We cannot get offended with the word of God. Amen. So come into agreement and alignment first in order to advance the kingdom. Then once we come into agreement and alignment with the Lord, he gives us access. He begins to open doors that have been shut to us. The word says that he even closes doors, right, that are unprofitable for us. So God begins to give us access. Don't you love that? Access. He opens doors that no man can shut. We find it in Revelation 3, about the 8th verse, where he starts talking to the church of Philadelphia. And he says, I know your works, and I know you're weary, I know you're tired. He says, but because you've kept my name in the midst of your hard place, your tight place, your broken place, right? Your empty place, your place of confinement, your oppression, your depression, right? In the midst of that rape that you went through, in the midst of everything, molestation that you endured, in the midst of the divorce that you found yourself in. God God said, in the midst of all of that, you did not deny my name. And so I open a door that no man can shut. He comes in and he gives us access. And once he gives us access, and so now we're in the door, right? We've entered the door. What happens? Assignments come. Assignments come. God said, you've, you've come into agreement with me. You've come into alignment with me. I'm giving you access. I'm opening the door. And now assignments are coming to you. Understand the difference between an assignment and an engagement. And this is not just for singers, but for singers too, for those ministers that you get these calls and they tell you, we're going to pay you this amount of money. Seek God. Is it an assignment, God? Are you sending me there to set a word? Are you sending me there to do a work? Are you sending me there, Lord, for your glory? Or are they just inviting me? And God will sometimes give you the choice. He'll say, well, honey, this is an engagement and it's up to you. Do you want to do it or don't you? So it's up to you. So I say this to say... An assignment is when God has put you on task and he's given you a work. He's given you a, his spirit on the inside that you might do the more. That you might do the more, okay? So you've got assignments 
And then comes authority. Now that God has given you an assignment, here comes his authority on top. He comes in and he lays his hand upon you and he pushes you forward into your kingdom work. Are you hearing me? He pushes you forward into your kingdom work. You've got agreement. You've aligned yourself with God. He's given you access. He's opened the door. He's given you now an assignment. And then here comes his authority to give you the measure of grace to do what he's called you to do. So now you have authority, right? You take authority where you go. This is giving you dominion in the task he set for you. Bless you. And so now that you have this authority, now you can begin to advance the kingdom. You begin to move forward. You begin to break up ground in your community, in your home. You begin to tear down strongholds in your city, in your state, in your nation. You begin to throw away the old and lift up the new and allow God's voice to, to herald a new cry. He says, cry aloud and spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. So you begin to do that and the kingdom begins to advance. All right, get excited. It, it begins to advance advance because you've aligned yourself you come into agreement God has given you access he's given you an assignment he's given you his authority and now you're advancing and lastly comes the apostolic being established this new work this new work this new work becomes established right it becomes established his work becomes established his what he set in order right because we have lots of people that are doing lots of things but what Jesus set was his five-fold gift. He set his five-fold gift to do the work of the ministry. And as I said before, he was multi-talented. He was multi-dimensional. He was multi-gifted. He was, he, he was just so big and so vast that he could not fill himself in one gift. So he said, no, you know, I'm big and I'm bad like that. I need five, right? I need five aspects of my character, five aspects of who I am in order to do my work. I need the teacher to teach like I teach, to be empowered with my gift on the inside, right? To teach, and not only to teach, what they do is they, they, they ground. They ground the people of God in the word. They ground the people in the word. Then you've got my, my, my pastors. My pastors, they guard the sheep. And I need my pastors to guard my sheep so that they will not no longer be raped and pillaged. Right then I'm raising up my evangelists who will go. They're set to go and they come in and they bring forth and they gather the sheep. Then I'm setting my prophets. My prophets speak my word. They establish my word. Then lastly, I establish my apostles who who govern. They govern the entire thing. Amen. I've been through. Two. Yes. Amen. Amen. So bless you all. I'm getting ready to wrap up now. Um, I want to just thank you for spending this time with me a little longer than I intended and much later than I promised to you. So those of you who are expecting me at 1030, uh, around 1030, I apologize. There was another one, uh, another Periscope that I wanted to honor. And so, um, yes, David, you're my key. Ooh, I want to check that out. Thank you for that suggestion, Susan. I'm going to check that out. But bless you. Um, if you've got any questions or thoughts, um, if you have any comments about today's study, please comment now. Let me know. Um, thank you for the hearts. I really appreciate it. I love you guys. Thank you for sharing the hearts. Um, bless you. Bless you. Speak up. Let me know what your thoughts are. Did you guys gain something from this? Did you learn something? Do you feel empowered? Do you feel ready to go seek God about what gift he has for you, what he's already placed on the inside of you? Way when you were in your mother's womb, when, he, when you were just a twinkle in her eye and God knew that you were going to come forth. He called you something. He spoke to you. And oftentimes I say to people, bless you. Bless you. Bless you, Sky. Bless you, Lady Eye. You know, I say, when God called you, what did he say? Thank you. Is it Jack here? Thank you. Bless you, cousin. Bless you. Thank you, April. That's always a blessing. Hallelujah. Bless God. Bless God. It is purpose. Thank you, honey. Yes. Start with praise. Amen. Bless you all. I pray that you've been empowered. Thank you, Kendra. And now you can begin to apply it. That's me. I'm the, I'm the applicable pastor. So when I give you a word, I can be lofty, but I want to, I want to give you something that you can chew on and walk through. So, so don't forget, we do have a third section of this. It is Jesus. I know, but who are you? So it's another identity message. And I want to break something down to you on that. So the next message is Jesus. I know, but who are you? Oh, April. 
So um, I'm only going for, for a minute, for a season. But I'm telling you, uh, God is empowering us to do a work. And he's expecting so much um, after us. No, I'm not Baptist. <laughs> I am Christian. I'm Christian. I'm a believer in, in, in God. I'm a follower of Christ. That's who I am. I'm non-denominational. I'm, I'm, I'm kingdom. Usually when people ask me what I am, I say I'm kingdom. Hallelujah. I'm kingdom. So uh, no denomination. All right. Uh, yes. Okay. Follow them on and I will, I will add, add you guys when people come on um, that are connected to me. I will definitely invite you to go check out uh, my father, my spiritual father in the ministry and my brother JD who may already be on. But if not, I will invite you when he comes on. Um, mighty prophet of God. Now we know who we are and that's a blessing with um, our, our tribe, our DNA. We know. Bless you. Kingdom children. Yes. We know who we are. I am the gift of the pastor. I am the office of the pastor. And I am also the office of the teacher. And I think maybe lesser than, but, but but teaching is a primary gift. But my heart, the burden of my heart that God placed on the inside of me is the pastor and an apostolic gift. Okay, that's me. You know, so I say all that to say in our family, we know who we are. And so I'm excited about the opportunity to, to be with them and to actually do that periscope where we're all together communicating. I think it's going to be mighty and it's going to be powerful to hear from the prophet. JD is like... He's 19 or something, man, and just um, in the prophetic, there, there is no other. Um, he's just really, really amazing. So uh, please watch my brother. Um, he is just so gifted. Like I said, our tribe is um, growing, and God is just grounding us um, so much. And so as I said, I know my call. I know I'm the pastor. I know that I'm the office of the pastor and the teacher. I know that God has grounded me that way. He's given me the burden of his heart on the inside. And I also know my brother JD does what he does. He's a sure prophet, sure and firm. The gift on him is sure and firm. So please check him out. I don't know if he's already on or if he's going to be on, but don't worry. I'll, I'll invite you all. I'll invite you. Okay. All right. Bless you all. Thank you guys. Oh, bless you, April. I love you. I love you. I love you. Love you all. Love you all. So have a good one. Um, let me just pray right now. Father, we seal this word in the blood of Jesus. We seal it now, oh God. Lord, that this teaching will not be stolen from us, oh God, but it shall produce a harvest. Let this be a seed that goes down deep and water it, God, with your word. Continue to draw them to your word. Continue to draw them to you, oh God. I pray that you would even blow fire upon it, God, that, Lord, they cannot sit, sit still, that the gift on sight of them, Lord, will unfurl. It will open, oh God, and it shall produce a mighty harvest, God, that it shall cause your kingdom to be advanced, Lord, that it shall cause them to even be healed and delivered in their own life, God. I pray right now, Lord, that you cause them to be lightning rods, even where you've set them, Lord, that they shall draw many to the kingdom. Bless them, God. Establish them, Lord. Even, Lord, cause their ankles to be firm so their feet don't turn. Bless them, God. Give them hinds feet and set them on their high places. Bless them. Unify us in your love and in your glory. We bless you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I love you all. Bless you. Um, keep the faith. Though times get rough and times get hard, keep the faith. Oh, beautiful inside. You can check it. When I'm done, you can watch it over. I'm sorry that you missed it. I will be back again. I think I'm coming back tomorrow about the same time so that I can give you part three of this. I love you. I love you. Um, we, we will get together. We will get together. Um, I promise you all. And I know many of you stayed on after watching already a long periscope. Um, but it was good and there was no way I was going to interrupt it. That is honor and that's how you do. And, and it was good. So necessary. Bless you all. Love you all. Have a blessed day, and we will be uh, chatting soon. Have a great uh, Wednesday night, okay? Take care, everybody. All right. Bye, you guys. <laughs>